Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, uh, your excellencies. Thank you for joining us here at the ODI. Um, I'm told that Monday mornings are, uh, should be avoided for events, but clearly we have a, 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 a packed house. Not only that, we, we have a huge online audience joining us today. Um, and it's not just for the fantastic Kenyan coffee we have here at the ODI or the, the wonderful vegetarian breakfast that we, we provide. Um, we're here to, to discuss, to think, um, and to, to change, uh, particularly in parts of the world where, where, where change is, is most welcome and needed. Um, so without further ado, I will introduce and hand over to His Excellency Wam Kelimeni, the Secretary General of the African Continental Free Trade Area, and Sarah Palatino, our CEO here at the ODI, to talk much more about the AFCFTA and the incredible work of which the Secretariat is doing. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dominique. I'll pick up from you. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Good evening to our online audience, wherever you may be joining from outside Europe. I'm really delighted to be joining in conversation with His, His Excellency Wankele Mene. Uh, thank you to all of you joining us in person. Um, right and early on Monday morning, as we said. Uh, what a fantastic opportunity to hear more from you. Let me start by introducing the Secretary General. Um, as Dominique has said, he is the Secretary General of the AFC FTA, the African Continent of Trade Agreement. We'll hear a lot more about that um, in a second. But prior to that, he also served as the Chief Director for Africa Economic Relations at the Department of Trade and Industry of the Government of South Africa and represented South Africa at the WTO. But you've also been lecturing and writing uh, on international um, trade, you know, worked in law, written and lectured internationally on international trade law, international investment law, and international business law. For those who are not fully familiar with the FCFTA, just, you know, a quick recap before we hear in a lot more detail from the Secretary General, the FCFTA is the world's largest free trade area. Uh, it includes 54 African countries. The only country that um, is not part is Eritrea and really is aiming to reducing, you know, international legal barriers to trade and investment amongst its members. I would say that this is an opportunity not just to transform African economies, but also to put measures in place to really, you know, create a, a more inclusive um, uh, environment for all its citizens. Um, the AFC, AFCFTA Secretariat is supporting member states to negotiate and implement um, the agreement. And in fact, trade, in, trade integration has been a topic of great interest um, here at ODI for many years. We've done a lot of work and a lot of analysis over the years on you know, examining the WTO, EPAs, um, regional um, integration efforts for decades. And we've also seconded ODI trade fellows to many governments. So we're all really looking forward to hearing you know, from you, um, to hear about your vision, but also hear how the implementation of the agreement is going. Um, there will be opportunity, uh, an opportunity for all of you to ask questions, also for our online audience to ask questions. Um, if you look at the, uh, the chat just below the video live stream on your web page, um, that's where you can put your questions and then I'll be collecting them here from uh, colleagues when I open up to the Q&A later. But please also amplify the conversation on Twitter. We want you know, to make sure that this goes beyond our room here and of course, um, those who are following online, um, tweet using the hashtag ODI Mene and uh, please include the handle ODI underscore global and uh, Mene one Kele. But let's get started. So um, DFC FTA is a crucial component of the African Union's Agenda 2063 strategy. The vision is to transform the structure of African economies you know, by boosting intra-African trade and investment. But what is your vision? for the trading block and, and his progress on track. How's he going? Tell us. Well, first, thank you very much uh, to ODI for inviting me and for uh, convening us here this morning. Um, and I want to thank also Dominic for the support and to uh, welcome everybody who is here uh, this morning. Uh, we, we have a, a significant challenge uh, on, on our continent. We have a a uh, well-established uh, pattern of market fragmentation, smallness of national economies, lack of uh, industrial capacity, uh, of course, continued export of primary commodities 
uh, to uh, uh, traditional markets uh, of the north. And this uh, has contributed, in my view, to uh, all of these factors have contributed to intra-Africa trade being at a very, very low uh, 18%. If you compare with intra-EU trade, uh, of course, everybody knows it is over 70%. So we have, we are at the lower uh, end of uh, regional uh, integration. Uh, there is not a single economy in Africa that can survive on its own without the integration uh, and the creation of um, a, a, a viable market for trade and investment. Not Egypt, not South Africa, not Nigeria, not a single country. We have to look at the lessons of how the European Union became competitive globally. And the way the European Union became competitive is by consolidating the market and creating a single market. We have 1.3 billion people. Uh, today, uh, Africa's combined GDP, uh, consumer spending, and business spending is uh, about 3.4 trillion United States dollars. It is projected to be close to uh, $7 trillion by the year 2035. However, if we continue on this path of fragmentation that we have been in for the last 60 years, that projection will remain nothing but a projection. Um, we will not see the benefits of a consolidated market. So the Assembly of Heads of States and Government took note of this and in 2015 said uh, by the year uh, 2017, we must have a free trade area uh, in Africa. And then of course they um, uh, cracked the whip and made sure that the ministers of trade move fast uh, with the election of the Secretary General that happened in uh, February 2020. So we have moved uh, relatively fast and we moved in the middle of the pandemic. As you mentioned, we now have uh, uh, 44 countries that are state parties to the agreement. Uh, only one country has not signed and we had to uh, be innovative in how we were making progress in the middle of the pandemic uh, towards a, the realization of a free trade area. So it has been a remarkable journey. Uh, as, as you correctly said, the AFCFTA is, is, is a flagship project of the African Union. And it's probably the most successful of the, the 13 uh, flagship projects of the African Union. And that is because the heads of states themselves um, are directly uh, involved, they are hands-on. Uh, from here, I am going to Uganda to, pr to brief President Museveni. Uh, so uh, they are very much in the driving seat. It is not easy to have 55 bosses, <laughs> uh, but I, I, I have to report to all of them. Uh, and, and that's really, that's why we've made such a big difference, is because of the leadership uh, and the hands-on um, approach of our heads of states. You will recall that a few years ago, um, you know, the summits of heads of states were, were dominated by peace and security, uh, you know, coup d'etat here, instability there. And then after that, they would go. Um, trade and investment issues were in the back burner. Now it is the opposite. Um, we now are seeing our heads of states being very focused on trade and investment. On the 25th of uh, November, we have a summit of heads of states on the AFCFTA, where I have to report to them uh, what, what I have been doing since they last convened. Uh, so that, that, in my view, the leadership uh, is what has enabled us to make so much progress in, in, in such a short space of time. And, and that's great. And you know, of course, we've, we've seen attempts at African integration before, but you know, having the leadership so strongly behind is obviously what is different with the FC FTA. Uh, but we're also seeing you know sub regions like Comesa, Sadak, you know, ECOWAS, you know, moving faster you know, towards integration. Uh, what are the lessons from previous attempts that you are bringing you know to what the FCA F F FC FTA is doing to make sure that you know we don't get uh, any of the obstacles we've seen in the past? 
Well, the first lesson that we learned is you have to have a, uh, a trade regime that has the capacity to resolve disputes. Uh, before the entry into force of the AFCFTA, there was not a single uh, trade regime in Africa that included dispute settlement as a pillar. Um, and of course, dispute settlement is important because this is what creates investor confidence. This is what creates uh, confidence of traders and business people uh, to in the implementation of, um, of the agreement. That was probably, I would say, the number one uh, uh, lesson that we drew from um, other regional economic integration arrangements, uh, whether it's West Africa, East Africa, or Southern Africa, the challenges were similar. Uh, because if there is no enforcement capacity, uh, then the, 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 the whole thing falls apart. Um, so that's the lesson that we learned. We now have a dispute settlement mechanism uh, that will have a two-layer system, first cost of, court of first instance, the court of final instance for uh, the ap appeals, and it will be very much uh, similar to uh, to the dispute settlement mechanism of the WTO. We made some improvements uh, here and there. The second important lesson that we learned is that you have to have tools um, for a trade. The if you negotiate a trade agreement in North America, it can almost implement itself. But in the context of the African continent, it's very, very different. You have to take um, uh, other measures. For example, the, the cost of uh, trade in Africa, the cost of currency convertibility, we estimated to be about $5 billion. Because you first have to convert uh, the Ghanaian CD into a third currency, uh, usually the dollar you are trading with your counterparty who is on the other side of the continent uh, in Kenya, they receive uh, the dollar or any other third currency and then they have to convert it uh, to the Kenyan shilling, $5 billion. So that's $5 billion of um, competitiveness for gone, uh, possibly uh, jobs for gone. So we introduced the Pan-African Payments and Settlement System digital payments platform uh, for trade uh, so that when you are trading, you are in Ghana, you want to trade with somebody in Egypt, you use local currency um, on a digital platform. That is um, important for inclusivity and affordability um, of trade. If we don't focus on these tools like this one that I've just mentioned, the benefits will go only to the large corporations. Uh, but if you have a small medium enterprise, you have um, informal traders who are trading across borders, but you don't create the tools, then the, the, um, the benefits will not be shared. Uh, they will, the focus will only be on the large corporations. The third uh, lesson that we learned is that we have to uh, take concrete steps to ensure that there are that countries uh, that are not as industrialized, countries that today may not have the the export capacity, that in fifteen to twenty years' time, these countries see the benefit of the agreement. So we introduced the AFCFTA adjustment fund uh, in the short term to enable uh, these countries to overcome. Uh, the, the revenue losses that will result from, from elimination of tariffs. Uh, in the long term, we, we, are, we are introducing industrial development interventions, the establishment of regional value chains. We already have uh, a network of regional value chains for, uh, for uh, the automotive sector. We will then um, also do the same for agriculture and agro-processing. And these tools are important because they enable uh, the trade uh, to happen. So 20, 30, 40 years time from now, we want to be able uh, to see countries that 30 years earlier uh, were not in an export capacity position, but uh, through these interventions, 
we see the, um, uh, the, the, the improvement in export capacity. So the lesson is if you focus only on reduction of the trade barriers and elimination of the trade barriers, you may not move far. You have to, you have to consolidate the reduction and elimination of tariffs along with industrial development capacity. So that on, not only South Africa benefits, or not only Egypt, not only that everybody uh, must see the benefits. Of course, it's going to take time. Um, uh, if you look at the fact that 55 countries, our contribution to global trade and output is 2.1%. Our contribution to global GDP is 3%. If you look at the figures for Singapore, Singapore's contribution to global trade and output is close to 6%. So clearly all of us combined, um, we, we, we have to take steps to make sure that we improve this condition of our continent. And I think that it is largely because of lack of industrial capacity uh, that we, we uh, continue on this track of over-reliance on the export of primary commodities. 2019, we imported $16 billion worth of pharmaceuticals, $16 billion worth of jobs foregone, competitiveness foregone. And that is because of a lack of industrial capacity. All of the components, if I can call them that, all of the components that are required to produce pharmaceuticals are there in Africa. Um, but we have not been able to establish the, the industrial capacity so that pharmaceutical companies can produce and do value addition uh, in Africa. So these are, if you don't pay attention to this important pillar of industrial development, the trade agreement uh, will be good only for lawyers um, and it, we will not see the results. It's very clear that you know, you're obviously focusing to make sure that the the weaker economies are also stand to benefit. But you mentioned inclusion, you know, more broadly. And I think obviously it, it is important that you know the agreement also delivers for you know the most vulnerable, it also delivers for the women, you know, young people, particularly young entrepreneurs for SMEs on the continent. How's he going to do that? <clears throat> well, the first thing we did, which again is another lesson, we looked at trade agreements around the world. And we made an assessment of um, how do you make trade agreements more inclusive. On our continent, um, 450 million jobs are created by small and medium enterprises that are largely led by women, contributing close to 60% to Africa's GDP, if not more. If you go to border communities, to border towns, you see that the drivers of uh, trade and commerce in those border towns are small medium enterprises um, that are led by women. So if we fail to take account of that, we will be creating a trade agreement that once again will be focusing only on large corporations. When in fact, the reality in Africa is that the drivers of trade and the drivers of Africa's economy are the informal sector and small medium enterprises. That is why we are negotiating the protocol on women and youth in trade. Uh, myself and President, uh, Her Excellency, uh, President Samia uh, Suluhu uh, Hassan, we hosted the first of its kind in Dar es Salaam uh, last month, um, a conference on women and youth in trade. With the idea that um, the, the discussions and the deliberations will feed into the the negotiations of the protocol on women and youth in trade so that it becomes a protocol that is responsive uh, to the needs of, of um, small and medium enterprises and young entrepreneurs. It is, of course, uh, um, going to be a difficult task, but I think it's an important task because we have to move beyond just expressions of aspirations for inclusivity, particularly for young people. That's why a protocol is so important because we, we have to codify those aspirations, codify them into legally binding uh, obligations for governments. 
one young person in that meeting said to us, President and Secretary General, in the protocol, there must be 40% um, uh, 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 equity for young people uh, who, who want to, uh, to trade across borders. This equity must be mobilized by our development finance institutions. Uh, another one said uh, in the protocol, if we say we are reducing uh, a, um, a duty, a tariff from 15%, if you are a small medium enterprise, that duty reduction must be quicker for you. So these are the very practical interventions that are possible to make. And it, it is going to be the first of its kind. So the point you raised earlier is, is, uh, is critical because we, we, we are 60 years behind. I've just mentioned the example of Singapore. We're 60, 65 years behind, however, uh, we are now able to demonstrate that we can leapfrog uh, by some of the tools that we are introducing and the interventions uh, that we are making. Of course, globally, we're seeing more fragmentation than cooperation in between um, states and, and global powers. We're seeing huge volatility in uh, uh, trade volumes and trade prices. We've seen you know, a, a trade war between the US and China and uh, you know, WTO dis discussions progressing very slowly. How can the FCFTA help Africa position itself to respond you know, to the challenges, but also the opportunities that you know, this context is presenting? Absolutely. It, uh, two examples. In the last three years, the COVID-19 pandemic and uh, the, the geopolitical context between Russia and Ukraine that have really exposed um, uh, some of Africa's challenges at the same time that have, that have presented an opportunity. So in 2020, in April, we received about uh, 6 million masks, uh, the African Union from Jack Ma. There were export restrictions uh, countries were imposing export restrictions on the tools that are required to fight the pandemic. And as we all know, the African continent was at the back of the queue uh, for production of, uh, uh, of vaccines. Um, however, if you look at what happened a year later, when um, even small medium enterprises were adapting their business models to respond to the crisis, producing masks, I went to Zimbabwe, and in Zimbabwe, they were producing their own uh, uh, hand sanitizer. They were not importing anymore. And they were also looking at how to export uh, oxygen uh, because of um, the need for, for, for oxygen. So I think we have started to see that transition um, learned from that crisis. The African Union was able to mobilize about uh, $250 million for vaccine uh, production pro, uh, 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 acquisition for the entire continent. Uh, so that was it was a learning uh, experience. But as I said earlier, sixteen billion dollars worth of pharmaceuticals. So COVID nineteen was an opportunity. As we speak today, Senegal, South Africa, uh, Algeria, um, Ghana have started vaccine production. Uh, not just for for uh, the the um, uh, for COVID nineteen pandemic, but with a view to develop uh, production capacity of other types of uh, vaccines. So, an opportunity that came out of a crisis. Uh, Ukraine, uh, Russia context. Inflationary uh, pressures of close to thirty percent that resulted uh, uh, from the over-reliance, the over-reliance of the African continent on the import of grains from Russia, Ukraine, some countries by over 70%, causing in food insecurity. President Kagame said uh, in July when we were there uh, that a continent of 1.3 billion people relying on a country of 44 million people to be fed by it by that country. So clearly we have to change this. Um, and where is the opportunity? I went to uh, a, a country in Southern Africa. The head of state of that country told me that 
they produce uh, their harvest, they have to throw away close to $200 million worth of uh, agricultural produce because they don't have the technology, uh, they don't have the uh, equipment and the investment to, to store, process, and export the grain. That country, where we have the right interventions, can actually export to the entire continent um, all the grains that are required. So between Ethiopia, Malawi, Zambia, uh, Zimbabwe, uh, these are countries that can feed the continent. And I said to this head of state, Mr. President, in 10 to 12 years' time, I see no reason why your country cannot be a net exporter um, of food for the continent. What the AFCFTA enables is, is the infrastructure, the legal infrastructure for the trade to happen, which we didn't have before. So if you are exporting grains uh, from Malawi to Egypt, the grains that you are exporting as Malawi have no competitive advantage relative to grains coming from a third country outside of the continent. So the AFCFTA is changing that uh, to enable uh, trade in basic agricultural products uh, to happen in the shortest uh, possible time. So for in my view, these are two observations about lessons learned and how the AFCFTA can be different uh, in, in responding to these crises. That's great. I mean, at the moment, there are a number of countries and blocs that are reviewing their aid, trade and investment approaches with Africa, you know, particularly listening to what you just said. How can they best support, you know, these integration efforts, you know, given what you say about the potential? Are you seeking anything from them? And, and if so, what? The support that I think is important is what ODI is doing, for example, um, uh, uh, and providing capacity uh, to uh, to countries from a trade policy making point of view. Um, uh, I, I was in Brussels in February for the AU EU summit, and I said to one of the commissioners, uh, she didn't like what I said. Nonetheless, uh, I said we don't want, uh, don't send us young people green behind the ears. 10 of them for me to babysit them in Accra. And then you say we're providing support. Uh, that, that, that model is, is, um, uh, uh, is in the past. It belongs in the old days. They were not happy days to begin with. Uh, so it's not a model that works. The model of support that works is investment in trade supporting infrastructure. It is support in uh, investing in uh, development finance institutions to enable them to lend onto um, uh, small medium enterprises, uh, support in infrastructure development, the trade corridors. That's where uh, the, the long-term impactful uh, support is required. And that support, by the way, benefits everybody. British government invests in infrastructure in West Africa. British investors benefit because their goods transit quicker. Um, and, and they are able to, uh, to access uh, markets more efficiently. So in my view, this is what uh, we should be focusing on, is trade supporting infrastructure, support for small and medium enterprises, uh, and development finance institutions to recapitalize them, to enable them to do onward lending. So for example, African Development Bank recently announced a, a, a youth investment bank. But if we, if we are serious about supporting the AFCFTA and its implementation, let's take $10 billion uh, as seed money for that youth investment bank to enable young people who want to trade under the AFCFTA to have the, um, the trade finance uh, uh, to do so. So I think these are the interventions that, that make a difference. Perfectly aligned. That's an agenda which we're doing a lot of work at ODI, you know, rethinking out in IFI's work, how we can you know, support regional development banks, so completely in agreement. I, I'm about to open up to the audience, so get your questions ready, but just one last question for me. We've seen some <laughs> recent dynamism you know, with the FCFTA. We have, uh, um, you know, there is this initiative I'd like to really, you know, hear more about, about, you know, I think it's eight countries that are mm -hmm. starting to 
just about at the end of this week yeah. to start trading with the FCFTA rules under this uh, um, um, guided uh, um, trade you know, initiative. Tell us more about it. Um, the, the big question, the question I always get asked, or I have been asked over the last two years, is when do we start trading? When do we start to see goods transiting? Um, and of course, we are as anxious as anybody uh, to see that. Uh, it has been extremely difficult uh, to, to get trade going under conditions of COVID-19. But what, where we are now is in a state re of readiness on the, the 7th of October to see goods moving from Ghana to Cameroon, for example, uh, from Kenya to Ghana. So in the Guided Trade Initiative, we have uh, Ghana, Egypt, Cameroon, uh, Kenya, Rwanda, uh, Mauritius, and Tunisia. These are the countries that have introduced the custom systems uh, for AFCFTA trade. So every country has got to introduce the, the, um, uh, the architecture, the legal architecture domestically uh, to enable the trade to happen. So for example, uh, Cameroon is importing ceramic tiles from, uh, from Ghana. The, the importer in Cameroon will see a, a saving, a duty saving of 20%. That's quite significant. Um, the, the exporter of uh, um, uh, uh, air conditioners uh, from Egypt uh, will also see uh, similarly uh, benefits. So the guided trade initiative is intended to demonstrate that the AFCFTA does actually work. Now, we know that um, it's going to take a long time, uh, 19, exactly 72 years from now is when the European uh, coal and steel pact started with five or six countries. And you look now where uh, the EU is as a model of market integration uh, with uh, uh, imperfections, of course. So we know that you have to start trade with a few countries to get the, the, the confidence of the system to demonstrate and illustrate that actually this does work beyond the, um, uh, uh, the law that is written there, which is the agreement. And so we are very excited about this uh, guided trade initiative. Uh, we have about, I think, about uh, 96 or 97 products that will be traded amongst these countries under AFCFTA preferences. And we will be able to demonstrate for each product the duty reduction that has resulted from the AFCFTA and what would have been uh, the duty applicable before entry into force of the AFCFTA. So it's very exciting. It very is. Exciting. I think we join in this excitement. I think we'll be watching yeah. how the initiative goes and you know, try to amplify so that other countries can be persuaded of you know, the value that it, it can bring. Let me open up to the audience. Um, if you raise your hand and introduce yourself, I think there is a roving mic somewhere that is coming to you, just uh, say who you are and if you are affiliated to any institutions. I'll start with the room here and then I'll go online. We've got about 20 um, minutes for questions. I'll take two or three at a time. I see there's you're desperate to come in and I'll come to you. Can, can I get my here? Okay. Dirk Vervelde from the uh, Overseas Development Institute. Uh, no Nigeria. longer, we are ODI, oh, yeah, yeah, the Overseas yeah, yeah. Development <laughs> Institute. Um, I'm a director for International Economic Development. Uh, I'm really impressed uh, by your comments and also by the, sp the speed by which um, uh, ACFTA has been negotiated, and particularly phase one issues already almost uh, ready, uh, and other issues are also uh, progressing really rapidly. And so quite soon we need to be thinking about implementation, and you've just mentioned this particular <coughs> example around, uh, around uh, uh, implementation. How uh, are you going to um, think about the role of the ACFTA in impl implementation? Uh, of the agreement. Uh, I think the suggestion was that every country should think about an implementation committee um, and sort of how, how do you see um, this interaction between implementation and negotiation happening in the, in the near future uh, so that the, the, the momentum can be, uh, um, can be uh, continued? Thanks. Uh, there's a gentleman here. Tegan, you go back. Hello, I'm Alan Beatty from the Financial Times. Um, Excellency, you were talking about the shocks that have happened, first the pandemic and now the effect of the war in Ukraine. The, the latter has obviously worsened the external financing environment considerably for a continent that has 
borrowed, uh, you know, borrowed quite extensively from abroad. <clears throat> and you were talking about the need for investment um, for adjustment. Apart from the MDBs, which are of course constrained, where is the financing likely to come from for the massive, considerable, of, you know, um, investments in infrastructure which are still needed? Thank you very much. And the judge. Mm -hmm. Good morning. Uh, I'm Robin George from the Boston Consulting Group. Uh, so you alluded to the, the lack of industrial capacity. Uh, we, we observe there are very few regionally integrated value chains uh, across uh, sub-Saharan Africa in particular. What are your plans to actually kick off uh, this kind of regional integration, particularly in uh, value chains? And are there any priority sectors that the AFTA is going to, to, to focus on? Thank you. Great. Let me just add one from the um, online chat. So we have Robert Francis from Bordelex in Brussels asking, what are the prospects for a continent-to-continent EU-AFCFTA -continent agreement? And there are others, but let's start with that. Um, well, thank you again for, for, for the, the questions and the comments. O on um, implementation, there is already a decision uh, by uh, the Assembly of Heads of States and Government, that every country must have a, um, a national implementation committee. The national implementation committee will comprise the range of different uh, um, uh, line function ministries, uh, 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 customs authorities, and we are required as a secretariat to help uh, countries to establish these national implementation committees. Uh, they will they will be really the driver of implementation at national level. Um, we are required to support uh, to support that work. Uh, we have not had a, a great success, I must confess, because only three countries have or four: uh, Kenya, uh, um, uh, Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, and Nigeria are the countries that have fully functional national implementation committees and so we have we have a lot more work to do there the 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 negotiations will happen in parallel uh, with the implementation because again to the point you raised earlier we learned from the experience of the wto uh, so we want to make sure that uh, as we implement uh, we negotiate and continue to negotiate where there are outstanding uh, areas of uh, of negotiation Regarding the, the, um, the, the infrastructure uh, gap, uh, the African Development Bank estimates that over $100 billion is uh, needed to uh, invest in, um, in trade supporting infrastructure in particular. That's actually an opportunity. Uh, it's an opportunity for investors uh, to, uh, to, to come in and see returns on their investment where they invest uh, in infrastructure. Already, African Development Bank has invested close to uh, uh, $40 billion over the last five years, close to $40 billion on trade supporting infrastructure. Uh, so we need more. Uh, African banks, since uh, over the last uh, uh, 25, 30 years, has invested about $25 billion in trade supporting infrastructure. There are other initiatives that are aimed at mobilizing resources. You would have heard uh, that uh, the European Union announced in um, uh, in February a significant amount. I think it was about 100 billion euros or 150 billion euros for infrastructure uh, development. Uh, the uh, US government uh, has also announced a 700 billion a G8 uh, initiative, 790 billion dollars uh, infrastructure uh, support. So. Uh, Yes, there are competing priorities um, in, the, um, in the global system about where to invest. But I think that um, with what I've just mentioned, I think certainly the appetite is there uh, for, uh, for investors to see returns on their investment. If you, go to, um, if you go to Togo today, you will see a globally competitive port, a state-of-the-art port, uh, that was supported by investment from um, the African Development Bank. Similarly, if you go to uh, uh, the border, uh, uh, Kasumbalesa, on the border between DRC and uh, the northern part of Zambia, there also you will see construction 
of a dry port, uh, that infrastructure is being supported by, um, by Africsim Bank. Uh, so, yes, there will be uh, questions, big questions, around uh, debt sustainability and, and, and debt servicing, uh, particularly given the current climate. But I do believe that there is an opportunity for trade financing um, uh, infrastructure for, for investment. The, the value chains that we have identified that are priority value chains are the automotive sector, pharmaceuticals, uh, for the reasons I mentioned earlier, uh, agriculture and agro-processing, and uh, transport and logistics. These will require investment. So beyond just us uh, sitting around the table and constructing a, a, um, a continental or regional value chain uh, in the auto sector, for example, uh, that's the easy part. The more difficult part will be to get uh, investors to invest in those value chains. In the auto sector, uh, we are in discussions, uh, uh, very advanced discussions actually, with the African Association of Automobile Manufacturers uh, so that we develop a truly continental uh, value chain, processed uh, 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 rubber in, um, in Liberia, uh, plastic tubes in Botswana, uh, processed leather in, in Ethiopia. Uh, these are things that are possible to happen. Uh, and I'm very happy that already for, for the auto sector, uh, we have already raised uh, about a billion dollars that uh, Africa Bank has put on the table for those countries that, uh, that want to be in the auto uh, sector value chain. Textiles and clothing is another important area, big driver of industrialization, of course, uh, creates uh, jobs. And we know the success story of uh, uh, a country like Lesotho that has transitioned from an exporter of textiles and clothing to finished garments. And now Lesotho is, is, is probably one of very few countries uh, on the African continent that um, exports to finished garments to uh, a very, very sophisticated economy market like the US. Uh, they are the largest supplier of, um, of Gap for, for garments. So these value chains, um, the study that we undertook indicated that first we need the investment, um, and second, the projections were that we have the potential to create uh, about 700,000 jobs and contribute to Africa's GDP uh, close to $10 billion uh, uh, at the end of a 10-year period. Um, we are at early stages, as I said, of establishing these value chains. It's incredibly difficult because you have to have the buy-in of the private sector. Uh, you can't do it without the, um, the private sector. So we are working to, uh, to mobilize the, um, the private sector. Then the, the last question on, on the, the grand vision. The, grand vision, the, um, the, the AFCFTA is, is not yet a customs union. Uh, it is a free trade area. Um, the model of integration that we are following is a, is a linear model of integration. So we are moving from, we shall move from being a, custo a, a free trade area to a customs union until one day the African continent becomes a monetary union. Uh, uh, of course, that is going to take time. We know the challenges, uh, you know, macroeconomic convergence uh, and, and those uh, related challenges to being a monetary union. But we are in, in that uh, um, line of integration. I mention this because I do not think that it is possible to have a continent to continent uh, a free trade area whilst the African continent is not a customs union. We will first have to be a customs union and then uh, negotiate as, a, uh, as that customs union with the... Uh, so it, it's, I, I would suggest that it may be too early, um, uh, but of course... The, it's it, absolutely. Yeah. And, and, uh, and by the way, the, the, there is already a great deal of cooperation between the African Union and the European Union on a range of different things, uh, trade and investment, development, um, peace and security. So the cooperation is already very, very well established. Right. Yeah. So just a minute left, a quick fire round. I've got a few questions from the online audience, which I do want to take also because there's a few women asking questions. And I'll see if there's any really quick question from the room and we'll, we'll land there, so you need to go. Um, 
Yes, I'll, I'll come to you in a second. Let me start with you online. Uh, so um, Helen Oriaro, no affiliation given, says, when do you expect the women and youth protocol to be finalized and how do you ensure it is fully implemented by state parties? Um, Sherilyn Rager from ODI asks what the progress on the negotiation of the FCFTA investment protocol is. Um, and then Mustafa, also no affiliation given, asks for a bit more details on the trade infrastructure that is needed across regions in Africa. Um, but please, the ladies, yeah, we'd love to be super quick so I can get everyone in. More questions over here. Um, Hannah Ryder from Development Reimagined. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Secretary General, for explaining a lot of, especially giving your vision. I think the point about African Monetary Union is very important for many to understand. I wanted to ask you a bit more about, kind of delve a little bit more into the regional integration question and to what degree you are trying to convene different regional partners or even different countries in particular, regions, to in, in the continent to try to get through some of the issues, for example, the regional infrastructure and prioritize regional infrastructure linked to PEDA, for example. So that's number one. But linked to that, also the question of preferential trade agreements. And I wanted to kind of ask, we've got opportunities like AGOA, we have opportunity, we have the number of preferential trade agreements that exist with countries or sets of countries in the continent. Where do you see those moving from your perspective? Thank you, and um, lady here. Thank you so much. Uh, Michelle Javunga from Global Policy House. Uh, just a quick question, Your Excellency, around how you foresee uh, diaspora and uh, uh, people of African descent, what role can they play, especially in terms of driving investments into the continent? And then just quickly, you talked a lot around the value chain areas. I, I mean, for me, I can see being a blockchain and investment company, I really foresee a lot of uh, technology playing a big part in actually driving um, uh, the flow of uh, um, activity within those value chains. So how can we actually speed up the adoption of technologies like artificial intelligence and blockchain in helping to support those value chains? Thank you. Uh, High Commissioner here. Uh, thank you very much. I'm uh, High Commissioner of Uganda, Nimisha Madbani. I think you know that President Museveni is a big driver of uh, private sector investment and flows across Africa and the region. Some of the questions that have been asked you already. How have you seen British reaction after having left the EU to set up a free trade zone, free trade area, free trade regional areas, all with uh, AFCA? Um, do, do you, have you got any sort of feed? Because there's an economy issue here, there's an economy issue on Africa. So I think there's a great potential. So I was just wondering what you had. Thank you. I'm afraid I'll have to leave it at that, otherwise you won't have yes. time to <laughs> respond. Well, the, the, um, we expect that the protocol on women and youth in trade will be um, ready early next year. The protocol on investment and the protocol on intellectual property rights, um, they will be adopted by the assembly in November uh, when they meet. Uh, so there is, there is good progress. Good progress is being made uh, to, um, uh, towards implementation of those, uh, those protocols. Regarding the, the regional economic communities uh, and how their relationship with the AFCFTA, we really are, our role is complementary uh, to what the regional economic communities are already doing. Uh, but we connect region to region. Uh, so regional economic communities are focused on intra-regional trade uh, we want to make sure that trade between the East African community and ECOWAS, that uh, indeed, that it does happen. And so we have a work program with the regional economic communities that is very much uh, complementary uh, in, um, in nature, uh, in terms of uh, looking at trade facilitation, for example, uh, transit of goods. If goods are transiting uh, from, the, from one region to, to the other, what kind of rules apply and what rules can we put in place to make the transition, the transit of goods uh, more efficient from region uh, to region. So that's really the, the heart of, um, of the AFCFTA. Uh, we, we have seen, we have seen uh, quite a fair amount of uh, infrastructure investment. It is nowhere near what uh, uh, 
you know, the levels that we would like. But I do, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, African Bank and uh, African Development Bank have a very active uh, trade finance uh, and infrastructure supporting uh, portfolios. Uh, te digital technologies are, are, are critical. I mentioned the example of the Pan-African Payments and Settlement System, which is a digital tool uh, for payments. So it's very, very uh, important. In the uh, uh, early next year, we will have a protocol uh, on digital trade um, in that protocol, all the things you've mentioned will be embedded uh, to enable trade using these digital tools. Uh, if you look at some of the uh, what is already happening, it's very encouraging. You have um, an exporter of uh, cut flour in Kenya who uses digital tools to access global markets. Uh, customs procedures that can also be enabled uh, using blockchain technology. So these are things that we are looking at, uh, and we want to make sure that uh, our continent does indeed uh, leapfrog uh, from a digital uh, technology standpoint, including payments, data processing, storage of data. Uh, all of these things will be covered in the, um, uh, the protocol on, uh, on digital trade. The, the diaspora, I think there are various opportunities. Uh, for example, uh, we mentioned, we, we established the AFCFTA Adjustment Fund. Uh, it will need to be capitalized. Uh, and so uh, we, uh, we hope that the private sector, will, uh, the, the diaspora will work with us, particularly pension funds, um, uh, private equity funds, uh, where we actually will be investing in our own development. Um, and so the, the role that I foresee for um, uh, the diaspora is resource mobilization investing, uh, uh, not donations, but investing with a view to seeing returns uh, on, on the investment. We already have programs uh, uh, that uh, investors, uh, people can invest in. The, the, the last uh, point uh, that uh, Your Excellency made on the, um, the orientation, if I can call it that, of the British government, when um, the previous prime minister at Chogom uh, in July in Rwanda, he said that um, uh, the UK government would like to join the AFCFTA and be part of the AFCFTA. <laughs> of course, it's not possible, uh, 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 but uh, that is what he said in his statement, uh, his opening statement at the, um, at the summit. Um, I think in part because there is a recognition that, um, that this is something big. Uh, I mean, this is... This is, since the end of colonialism, this is the biggest and the largest success story to come out of the African continent. Um, and in my discussions with him, uh, I, I, I got the sense that um, in his mind, this was offering much better than whatever the EU um, was, was offering. <laughs> um, and so that is why he said what he said. Um, we will continue to work with the British government um, we will continue to uh, exchange uh, uh, and collaborate uh, because we, this is a very significant market uh, for many, many countries uh, in Africa. It's a very important market. Um, and there are a, a large number uh, of investors, uh, British investors who have invested on the African continent. So what we want to present, uh, the value proposition for investment is that the AFCFTA is a market of 1.3 billion people. And as I mentioned earlier, the projections are very, very positive. And so the, we encourage the British government to look at the AFCFTA as an opportunity for investment. Um, and how that will progress, whether or not one day we will have a free trade agreement between uh, the two sides, um, I, I don't know. But I do know that... Uh, there is a significant opportunity uh, in the AFCFTA for the British government and for British investors. Uh, I hope that when the new government gets settled, that we will see more. Um, uh, we will see more interaction. Uh, this is my my third visit, I think, this year uh, to uh, to London, and that's a demonstration of how seriously we take the relationship uh, with the British government. And uh, as I said, I hope that uh, 
when the government, the new government, gets settled, that we will see more more interaction. Yes. Thank you so much. We are at time. Clearly, there is so much interest in the discussion that we could have carried on for a lot longer, but um, you have to go, and I'm sure our guests also need to go and start their, their work day, but I really want to thank you. Thank you for your openness, you know, about the challenges and what it will take to really deliver on the agreement, you know, your honesty about the speed and, you know, how long you know, it will take to deliver, but above all for the excitement that you're leaving us with, you know, about what a really integrated African market can deliver and particularly one that is, you know, really um, carefully thinking about, you know, the inclusion um, of women, youth, entrepreneurs, you know, those who can, you know, really see the potential um, be realized. Um, all, I'm sure all of us will be um, wishing you every success in uh, supporting the negotiations, supporting the implementation of the agreements, responding to 54 bosses. I don't know how you do that. Um, and of course, the ODI will be you know, here supporting you going forward. But thank you very much for sharing your uh, vision with all of us. Thank you to you for being with us um, today and also to our online audience. And please join me in thanking the Secretary General. Thank you.